please uh, come to the stage when I call your name. Uh, so our first panelist today is uh, Chris Cruz, the Chief Deputy of Operations for the California Department of Technology. Join us, Chris. <clears throat> Thank you. Our next panelist is Adrian Farley, the Chief Information Officer of the California Department of Justice. There you go. <clears throat> And then finally, uh, our next panelist is Jan Ross, the Chief Information Officer of the State Treasurer's Office. So Jan, thank you. Yep. So please walk, yeah, um, please join me welcome our, our panelists. Thank you guys. And we really look forward uh, to this session. And uh, Bill, I'll let you take it away. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Dan, for uh, that great introduction. Uh, and uh, thank you to our panelists for being here today. Uh, I'm going to uh, leave the podium in just a minute with the, uh, with the handheld microphone uh, and uh, see, uh, look, look for folks who have questions. But um, just to get started, you know, this is our, our CIO panel discussion. We're really interested in, in your initiatives, your insights. All of you have uh, been with the state for for years in, in running uh, big organizations. So uh, I would like to just get started. And uh, you know, full disclosure, I, I worked with Adrian in the governor's office and the California Department of Technology. I feel like I've worked with all of you when I was w at the state. Uh, so uh, you know, I just look forward to having a really good discussion this morning. I think we have about 45 minutes. So uh, just to get started, Jen, why don't we start with you uh, to get, you know, tell us about some of your uh, initiatives, what we can expect to see in 2015 from the state treasurer's office. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, it, it feels a little bit like the Spanish Inquisition. I've never been up here before, and those lights are really intense. Um, but to get started, uh, for 2016, um, we have alternative procurement and open data, fun, oddly enough, just aligning exactly with what's been said so far. So um, with an alternative procurement, we are releasing an RFO at the end of January for our debt management system two. And this is an alternative procurement in that before I had joined the treasurer's office last January, um, they had been working with Caltech through the stage gate process and developed an approach to replace their entire legacy debt management system, legacy 2004. And um, they had released a draft RFP to get a vendor response on their more than 1,000 well-stated requirements. And the response that they got back was, this is incredibly complex. And a lot of those requirements have to do with your core debt management system that is working well right now. But like many other legacy systems, the requirements had outgrown that core system, so there were lots of auxiliary systems supporting it. So um, we went back with our procurement uh, consultants, Grant Thornton, and we went back with our IVMV consultants, Infinity, and we came up with um, incorporating all the feedback. We actually reached out to all of the vendors who provided us with feedback, and um, we talked with them a lot, and we. Um, learned that the core of the debt management system, which is an Oracle platform, is a very viable platform still. And with um, greater expertise than is currently in-house at the state treasurer's office, we could actually build in the functionality of these auxiliary systems that are supporting it. And if we took that approach of modernizing what we already have, then we could reduce the scope of our requirements and we could make it more finite. And so where this becomes an alternative model is we looked at other um, procurements that were working well in the state and specifically two that uh, rose to the surface was the Department of Water Resources and the uh, Department CalPERS. And in both of those organizations, they're doing a modernization effort where they have one overarching contract but then within that, they are doing several iterative optimization initiatives. So they award one contract, but then they actually bid and award underneath it. I, I shouldn't say award. They authorize within that scope of the one contract work authorization orders that allow 
several multiple sequential optimization initiatives to be built and delivered, built and delivered, built and delivered. And so we went to the legislature actually last spring and we proposed this um, to the legislators as an alternative for what we were currently looking at, which was a complete replacement. And Senator Roth specifically, um, in both our hearing and other hearings that we listened to, talked um, repeatedly about off-ramps. Where are the off-ramps for the state? In the event that the state and the vendor relationship choose to terminate, how is the state not left with nothing and the vendor not frustrated by, by only being partially paid um, for something that they have only partially delivered? And so this model incorporates the ability to, to award one contract at a set term and a set price but then within that, authorize a work order authorization and pay the vendor for that piece of functionality that's built on our existing system. So the state immediately receives value for that piece of functionality that's delivered and the vendor is paid for it. And then we do the next one and the next one and the next one and the goal is to have it all done by a certain time and within a, a certain um, cost parameter. But at any point in time, as each of those pieces of functionality are delivered, there is the possibility for an off-ramp if that's so warranted. And of course, we hope that this model will provide the kind of blending and partnership between the vendor and state so that that separation is never warranted and we're successful and it's a model that can be achieved. And we've received a lot of um, support from CalPERS specifically on how they've made this work. So that's our alternative procurement, that RFP is targeted for release um, end of January, pending approval from Caltech on our SPR2. And um, we hope to award um, the contract July 1. And then in the way of open data, the treasurer has been a champion, huge champion of government transparency. Uh, when I was with him at the controller's office, we released three transparency websites, publicpay.ca.gov, track prop 30 and by the numbers and the first two won project of the year award um, back to back from the sacramento project uh, chapter um, project management institute chapter sacramento and then the last one we saw this morning won uh, best of the web and in each of those at the time uh, controller chung really wanted to liberate data and get it into the hands of the constituents and so that was his passion as he came over to the treasurer's office and we knew that that's where we would start. So we went to um, one of the great silos of data, the treasurer's office, 30 years of debt data, and it's, it includes everything from RANs and bonds and notes um, from all government entities, all local government entities, um, K through 12, Mello Roos, JPAs, um, counties, state, everybody out there. And we launched an open data website um, November 17th, and it's called debtwatch.treasurer.ca.gov. And we have several more planned through the remainder of his administration. And he is just extremely passionate about informing the citizenry, um, making them more educated and providing them with self-service tools. So his goal was never to just put up open data catalogs. He absolutely will not just dump data into catalogs and say, you know, go help yourself and figure it out. This is very complex data as it was with by the numbers at the controller's office and uh, the data from the Proposition 30 that the voters had approved and, and government pay. Um, so we have built graphical interfaces and we have videos and we um, allow people to see what they can do with the data and how they can interact with it. And then because it's an open data platform, like what was done with the hackathon, we're hoping people will draw it together, perhaps with data from by the numbers and see how robust uh, a local government's health profile really is. So that's it in a nutshell. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jan. Uh, you know, I really want to come back to this idea of the alternative procurement and the off-ramps. I think that's very interesting and something that we should uh, we should talk about, but before we do that, um, Adrian, how about if you uh, give us an update with uh, what's happening at the California Department of Justice? Sure, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and talk with all of you today um, and be with so many accomplished colleagues. Um, we're really working in three key areas. The first is around digital engagement and uh, 
how we can use digital technologies to better empower, engage, and inform Californians. The second is really how we can take the vast amounts of data that the Department of Justice has and do a couple of things. First, uh, leverage that data for better public policy and then how that data can be used strategically to keep our community safer. And then the third area that we're working on significantly is around um, open data. And in that vein, we launched um, our Open Justice web portal. We're now working with the White House uh, and several other law enforcement agencies across California and the nation to provide the most uh, extensive criminal justice uh, data that's available on a statewide basis. So those are some of the key areas that we're focused on right now. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, Chris, what's happening at the Department of Technology? <clears throat> Actually, again, thank you for uh, allowing me to be here. And again, it's a privilege to, to be here in front of everybody and the esteemed colleagues, as Adrian mentioned. You know, I think within the Department of Technology, we look at 2016 as an era of new and adaptive technologies and emerging technologies. Um, I think Carlos laid out a pretty fundamental vision in his speech about some of the things that we're looking at moving forward. Obviously, Cal Cloud is a big part of that business. Um, we're, we're faced with really transitioning to a service-based type organization at the data center. You know, we understand that we provide mainframe services, we have tenant managed services, and we have managed services environments. But we need to add additional lines of businesses to address competencies and capabilities of other service providers in the data center area. So one of the things, obviously, is we expand Cal Cloud. Not only do we have infrastructure as a service with IBM, but we, now we have these vendor-hosted solutions and opportunities. And really what we want to do is we want to be vendor agnostic. We think that that's very important to widen the playing field as we move forward. Um, as Carlos mentioned, in terms of technology, we'd like you to look at our infrastructure as a service, but if there are technical specifications or business requirements that don't meet your peripheral needs, then by all means, let's look at other software as a service and platform with a vendor where it makes sense. Because again, at the end of the day, we all are entrusted and empowered with bringing business value and tangible business outcomes to our customers. And I think that that's really important. Um, the other area too that I want to make mention of, and, and obviously the, the colleagues also talked about this, is our open data portal. Uh, we're partnering with our governor, op, governor ops agency to really work on a data, open data portal that overlays our state geo portal inside of that and integrates directly with our ca.gov site. Um, we're also remodeling our ca.gov site, which is the governor's main site, to bring all of this information together. We think that really one-stop shopping is really important to intrinsic and, and satisfying our needs of our customers. And that's cataloging the data sets from Department of Justice or the State Treasurer's Office or from the Health and Human Services Data Center to ensure we have that information rolled up and integrated into one common portal. We think that that'll be better for citizen engagement, for civic engagement, and really, again, driving business-based outcomes as we move forward. Another area that's very exciting that we're also looking at is the Office of Civic Innovation, Office of Data and Civic Innovation. And what this really entails is talks about open source. We want to create an innovation lab within Cal Cloud. We think this will give uh, folks an opportunity in state government to try different approaches, as again, what Carlos mentioned, more of a modular open data approach to looking at data. Um, when we previously had this codeathon with the Governor's Green Challenge a month ago, we got a lot of great ideas about open source data and how we can take that data and expand upon that and complete implementations in a way that's in a more streamlined fashion. So again, we want to offer this innovation lab as a sandbox for state entities and government entities to come in and really look at how we could collaborate and partner on data moving forward and building applications is we think that this is really important as we move forward that really, again, in terms of big data and big projects, that Big Bang probably doesn't work. So why don't we take a more partitioned or integrated approach to how we implement systems and applications? And maybe we'll have, you know, drive higher value and less risk in terms of that information. So these are all areas that I think are driving innovation and transparency. And I think we're in a time that, you know, we can really partner and move forward to provide more efficiencies and effectiveness in how we do business in the state of California. Uh, the other area, too, is obviously our, our project management office. You know, we're rolling up an enterprise project management office. We think it's important to have enterprise tools and standards throughout the state. And that way we have a common process, whether it's our STAR process and the stage gate process of moving forward and, and, and providing that data in an entry level process and condition, but also at the same time managing projects within that portfolio. And if we have a common portfolio, then we can have common standards on our website for up-to-date information about all of our projects moving forward. 
So we think the project management office, as Carlos mentioned with Tamara Armstrong, will be that leader in rolling things up to an enterprise level. And then having an adaptable standardized project management framework. We think that that's really important for effectuating the right types of changes as we move forward within the state. Because a cookie cutter process, believe it or not, is a better way to do business. So those are some of the things that we're looking at in terms of proliferation of technology and then our mobile site gallery. We understand that smart government is very important as we move forward here in the state. So how do we proliferate that? Well, 13 million Californians have smartphones. So how do we take mobile apps and write the necessary mobile apps again to bring business value, to give our customers and citizenry the information that they want in an expedient fashion? So I look at all of these things as a huge transition for the department next year, but also for the state, and us driving and institutionalizing technology as we move forward. Thank you, Chris. Uh, that's. Uh you, you mentioned a lot of things there. Uh, the uh, Civic Innovation Lab in particular is uh, of, of great interest to me. But before we get too far away from it, I want to talk about the alternative procurement Jan mentioned. Uh, she said she's actually working with your office. And obviously, you, you guys have a lot happening in uh, uh, project reform, procurement reform. Can you talk about how you guys work together? How is, how is Jan's alternative uh, procurement different than some of the things that you're doing? How are they the same? Can you talk about that, Chris? Well, I think what we're trying to do with the Office of Data and Civic Innovation, and again, this is in its infancy stage, is really to look at um, you know, procurement reform, working with our policy folks led by Andrea Roman, and really looking at partnerships in a way that we can simplify data and bring what I call projects and procurements to, to a, a quicker resolution. And so by having all this information and looking at common standards and commons approach, I think we'll be better off in terms of moving forward in that particular area. So is, the, uh, is this something that your enterprise architect, the state enterprise architect, is, is working with Jan on? I mean, how, how does, mechanically, how is this working? Do you set the policy for the treasurer's office in terms of technology? Well, that's one of the things we're trying to look at with this new um, Office of Civic Innovation is where Ben Word and the, and the enterprise architect comes in. But right now, he is a part of the stage gate process and looking at policies and procurements. So um, Ben and his staff review all of the documents that come in to look at core standards to drive us to some standardization across the state. We're also looking at, uh, as a part of Ben's role, is to looking at really looking at enterprise architecture at a governance level with the AIOs and being able to have that, not only for hardware and software, but everything else that, that addresses really architecture-related standards and methodologies. I think that that's really important because that'll drive us to industry best practices and ensure that we're not in a position where we're looking at stovepipe applications. And the more that we can drive to enterprise technologies and roll it up to a statewide level, the more efficiencies and effectiveness that will result in that. We can drive down cost, and also we can increase time to market in terms of implementation. So, Jan, you had a comment. Well, we've been working very closely with Andrea's um, side of the house with uh, project oversight and with procurement. And even though we are pursuing the RFO, um, which is under the authority of DGS, um, we, we've uh, collaborated with everyone. We still have um, Carlos's project uh, oversight group. We have an IPOC consultant from Caltech on, um, and so that's under Rebecca Stilling's authority. So she's very involved with the direction that we're pursuing. And then um, Marnell and her office was involved when we were going with the RFP procurement. So their procurement analysts have been involved from the infancy stages of this project before I joined the treasurer's office. So they are still providing oversight um, even as we develop our RFO and work with DGS. And then we also have DGS. So um, while the treasurer's office is a constitutional office, we are under the policies for state procurement. We abide by the policies for um, all of the project guidelines and state procurement processes and policies. So uh, we have Jim Butler's uh, group fully vetted. I know I saw Jim here. I'm, I've been a thorn in his side on this project. I've been bugging him so much about it. But uh, we're trying to make sure that we have all of our you know, ducks in a row on this and we have buy-in from all of the, the state essential parties. I know Carlos spoke to wanting some you know, successful IT projects out there that are in the headlines. and. Um, we're hoping to partner with Caltech so that this is one of their successful projects that they can point to. Uh, while CalPERS has been very successful with this model, they're not under the authority. They're very um, independent and exempt. And um, so it, it would be nice to have something in the, in the core body that um, he can point to and say this was a successful procurement. 
Great, thank you. <clears throat> okay, so moving on, uh, talking more about uh, the, the civic tech community, the hacker community, uh, also known as, uh, you know, the, the coders, codathons, and so forth. Adrian, this question is for you. I know the Attorney General just, um, just a few months ago was, uh, uh, gave a, a big press conference talking about the open, open justice data portal. And it seems that she's addressing some social issues in, in a uh, very technology savvy kind of way. Um, what, how do you uh, envision the, the hacker community helping uh, the Department of Justice's agenda in terms of um, utilizing data, um, you know, creating new applications or systems or, or um, you know, just um, applying technology in a way that is new and different and perhaps different than a lot of the traditional IT companies uh, that help with systems integration, for example. Can you talk about the Attorney General's agenda? Sure. So um, <clears throat> our, our broad approach is to um, look at all opportunities for public-private partnership. So for instance, uh, we're in the process of working with a nonprofit organization called Bayes Impact that is uh, basically been funded by a lot of technology organizations, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the California Healthcare Foundation, and they're working with us to look at innovative ways to um, collect data from the more than 800 law enforcement agencies that we work with across California focused on use of force information. So there's a, the legislature passed uh, a bill last year, or this year, uh, that we'll be implementing that will require us to collect all data from local agencies when there's a use of force incident, when an officer, uh, when there's an officer involved shooting or when there's any kind of other force inflicted in the course of an arrest process. So we've been working with uh, Bayes Impact, uh, which is a nonprofit group that's focused on that area. Um, and then in other areas, we're working with a lot of different civic technology companies uh, and organizations, including Code for America, to drive uh, strategies that will, A, develop open source platforms that are developed in partnership with DOJ and then, uh, and then can be reused by uh, other uh, local and state governments across the country. So everything that we build with DOJ resources, uh, we're on the course to open source and make it available to the community as a whole. Okay, Chris, so back to this uh, Civic in Innovation Lab. You talked about this, and this sounds like news. I, I hadn't heard that term or that or uh, any news about that organization before, so um, I'd like to know just a little bit more, but he here's my question. Um, can you talk about uh, the shift, if any, from traditional IT consulting to this new civic innovation space using, uh, you know, the, the, the hacker community, hacker in a good way, uh, the, the folks that are, are there doing it for the public good, not necessarily working in big companies, uh, the companies that have been doing this for a long time. Can you talk about the uh, shift, if any, and, and how's that happening? Well, I think, you know, one of the things that we're seeing, obviously you had the Coders for America here a few months ago, right? And they talked about the proliferation of change in government and the federal government space and local and county and state government. And I think one of the things that we're starting to see is that, you know, that they're streamlining the way that they do business, that time to market is cut. And with the agile approach and different ways of how you streamline technology and implement it, there's different methodologies and standards that we need to come up with because we see this long waterfall approach in the traditional ways that we've done business with the system development lifecycle that these things have gone on for two, three, four, five, six years. And usually when that happens in terms of coding, you're going from a configurable type application now to a custom build application that your risk goes up. And I think doing things in a prototype method will help expedite technology, decrease your risk, and bring business value in terms of successful business applications. I think one of the things that we're trying to do with the Innovation Lab is look at how we can increase security. That's always been a challenge around open source because you have different folks in different sandboxes trading and transitioning data or code back and forth. So how do you ensure that folks aren't leaving open-ended traces into their code, and how do you manage and secure that? So really our proposal is really to look at an innovation lab on how you manage data 
how you secure code and how you ensure that when this is being passed around from one programmer or one entity to another, it's done so in a way that uh, decreases the state's risk. And that's looking at two-factor authentication, looking at some identity access management in terms of how we manage and secure this, and making sure that those security methods are in place. And I think that that's going to be really important. And also, too, developing policy around this. I know that there was an open source policy, I believe, that came out in 2010. Um, so we would need to modify that policy today based on where we're at from a technological perspective and ensuring that the right policies are in place and that we can enforce those as we move forward. So as folks submit S1BAs, that we understand what that language is and the way that we can manage that moving forward using agile or other approaches and frameworks. Okay, my, uh, my next question is for you, Jan. Um, it's a two-part question. First, uh, has the Treasurer uh, met with uh, the folks from Code for America? Does the Treasurer work with these sort of uh, NGOs and, and various groups out of this community? Um, and then uh, the second part of the question is uh, not necessarily related, but um, what, do you, what do you think the potential is for our own stake workforce uh, to participate in, in these sorts of activities, you know, to be able to have the freedom to, uh, to you know, take some time off from their, their normal day job, their nine to five job, maybe have an alternative assignment to do some uh, creative work. So two part question. Okay. Um, the treasurer has not met with anyone from Code for America at the treasurer's office where I have been a part of that, however, he um, participates in about 700 meetings a year, literally, and um, he is very technology-oriented and savvy, and he may very well have met with someone um, in some other state at some other location um, regarding Code for America. Um, at the treasurer's office proper, we uh, meet with vendors approximately once a month, and um, so people that have cutting edge solutions or technology proposals or something that aligns with what his objectives are, he will host them, entertain them, I'll participate in those meetings and um, he, he stays very current, very well educated in everything that's happening technology related. And as far as what I think the possibility is for state employees taking um, sort of a sabbatical to do creative research, um, I can't imagine that happening, from my perspective, I can't imagine that happening in um, a core department that has a function that is not technology sponsored. Um, the IT people at the treasurer's office and the controller's office um, and franchise tax where I worked, they have missions. and um, The franchise tax board, their budget differs considerably from controllers and treasurers, and treasurers being the smallest of all, I have less than 50 people who work for me. There's absolutely no way I could allow people a sabbatical. We're just not funded for it. And we have to be very mindful of, we get our paychecks on the backs of taxpayers, and they have charged us to do a specific responsibility. And at the treasurer's office, they have not charged us with going out and doing technology innovation and creation. It has to deliver um, something related to our core mission and if it doesn't we're wasting the taxpayers money but if Caltech has that within their mission I know um, they try to be primarily um, self-funding from the services they provide so it's probably not directly within their mission but they may be able to um, to justify part of that or perhaps franchise tax where they have a very large IT department um, as it maybe it runs in a parallel path to their core mission, but the smaller departments, I just, I can't imagine how we explain that to the taxpayers who are paying those paychecks. Sure, fair enough. I think uh, that that obviously is a, a much better question for Chris, but before we go there, Adrian, what's your reaction to that? Uh, whether or not state employees could, you know, have the freedom, some sort of freedom to be able to participate in this uh, alternative, uh, more creative type research to come up with uh, different product projects? Well, I mean, I, there are 24 hours in the day, so, um, I mean, I have employees that work, 
you know, 20 hours a day on projects for us. And when we're close to deadline, they're working nonstop. And people throughout the organization, whether they're assistant programmer analysts all the way up to CEAs or they're grinding it out um, with the staff at any hour, I mean, over the weekend, whatever it might be. Um, so it's really engaging and empowering your employees so that they are driven to do this work independent of whether or not they're paid for it. I mean, the most engaged and interested employees are, are working in government, not for the pay, but for the ability to deliver real change and positive benefit to the people that we all work for. And um, I mean, we're just very lucky to have a, such a, a dedicated staff that is put, willing to put in their own time to deliver on, on those kinds of solutions. Sure. Chris, uh, do you want to uh, give us your, your response and talk a little bit more about this innovation lab mm -hmm. uh, in terms of state employee engagement and uh, working on these types of projects? Well, again, I think it's a different way of doing business, and it brings folks together in terms of having a common environment to manage it. I mean, I, I think Jan spoke to some of the challenges with State Treasurer's Office. Adrian talked about with his resources and employees, how they manage. But if we had an environment that we could co-manage together and write and develop code, maybe we can leverage this information for multiple applications. And that really, way we begin to streamline and roll things up to a standardized level of doing business. Um, obviously, we have talked about a virtual work environment. That's very important as well, is ensuring that we have the necessary infrastructure in place to support an open data environment. Uh, and that also is a priority, I think, in our organization. As we try to bring in more millennials into our work environment, it's increasingly important that we have a virtual work environment framework in place. Because if we don't have that infrastructure, we're not going to have the type of programming expertise and folks that have this particular experience to come into our organization or come into the state. So again, going back to policy, I think that we could partner in starting to develop standards um, also with the private sector on how we can go about doing this and working together to ensure we're bringing the right types of business out outcomes and values. And also retaining the right kind of workforce that we need to have in the state moving forward. Because if we can't put a virtual work environment in place and we can't reinvent ourselves to more of a smart government tenancy, we won't attract those millennials into the workforce as we move forward and see more people retire. So I think reform starts now within some of the things that we're starting to prepare and uh, introduce. Great, thank you. Uh, now I'm gonna go out to the audience uh, and uh, see what you all have to say. Who has the first question for our panel? Anyone? Greg Kiefer. Bill paid me to ask the first question. <laughs> the, uh, um, Carlos mentioned a practitioner's database. Um, I was wondering what some of your thoughts are on building that database and how you would maintain and support that. I've had that concept for about 10 years of building a, a kind of a statewide LinkedIn system for just internal for state government that's maintained by employees. Um, if you're going to build a database, I'm kind of trying, trying to get your ideas on how you might build that and sustain that without having something that's actually contributed to by uh, each of the employees and, and allows you to share that information and connect with others at the state. It's Chris' question. Any of you can answer that if you, or, I you, mean, can, or you can huddle on it first if you want to. <laughs> I'll offer just uh, kind of maybe a contrarian perspective and that is that LinkedIn has built the world's largest professional social network. Let's go to LinkedIn and create a community there because, I mean, tra traditionally let's build something new is very appealing because then it's exactly to our specifications. Let's go to the place where people are, whether it's Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter or whatever it might be, leverage those platforms that exist and build the kinds of frameworks there rather than building something new. Yeah, and also, too, I think your point, leveraging things that are already in place and standards. I know that uh, CalPERS has a, a practitioner's type database, and that we're asking maybe to leverage some of that code as well to look at standardization and then sharing that across uh, you know, state government might be a way to start as well, and then make the necessary modifications as you want to add more requirements into that. 
I mean, again, I think if we have to build these things from scratch, they're very complicated. They present a high level of risk moving forward, and we probably don't want to put ourselves in that situation. Okay, next question. Uh, this comes from John Thomas Flynn. Uh, this is for uh, Jan. Uh, regarding our, the debt management system project, what lessons have you and uh, the treasurer learned from your $300 million payroll system debacle at the controller's office? That's John Thomas Flynn. <laughs> well, thank you for that opportunity to discuss lessons learned. Um, <laughs> That's one of the very reasons that we undertook the task force to re-engineer procurement on large IT projects. And we drew together 13 people from all across the nation that were experts in procurement and IT and came up with 21 recommendations on how to improve procurement for large IT projects, how to re-engineer that process. And um, Carlos and his representatives participated as well as Kim from IBM and several vendors um, had input into that. And so we actually are taking those recommendations to heart. We testified before the legislature while I was with the controller's office on those task force recommendations, as well as did the chair of the task force, Rosie Alvarez. Um, and one of the things is don't be so confining on the requirements. When we came over to the treasurer's office and we looked at the 1,000 plus well-written, tightly defined requirements that essentially were beyond what the vendor community could easily grasp, we went back to that report, that task force findings, and one of their recommendations was stop being so constrictive and writing out over a thousand recommendations and go for the business objectives. And so that's exactly one of the lessons we are applying to this debt management system too. And in fact, we've taken that 1,000 plus requirements and moved it out to the bidder's library. So when the RFO is released, any of the vendors who intend to participate can avail themselves of those requirements, but they are not the requirements written into the RFO. We are going for um, functional objectives, business objectives, and the contract will be written around what we want to achieve and the core functionality that we have. So um, again, the off-ramps that I mentioned earlier, how do we have the opportunity for off-ramps and not go for that full waterfall um, development where the, the state and the vendor have great risk and at the end of a three to five year engagement, um, we've seen what happens with that risk. So we're changing our procurement model. So everything about what we are doing with DMS2 reflects very um, intensely learned um, lessons from prior experiences and then not only from the um, 21st century project, but certainly from the 24 IT projects that were very successful during the eight years that I was with the controller's office. Um, we have many lessons learned from those as well, and so we are taking that and the agile development processes that we used on the successful projects and again applying them to the DMS2 as well. Thank you, Jan. Um, thank you for being a good sport about that one. Uh, so it's Chris, reality. I actually have a follow-up question. Uh, the task force report, TechWire covered that task force yes. report as it came out, and it uh, actually, I can't remember if, if Director Ramos was on the actual task force. He was not, but he was an advisor. Right, and so uh, it seems that the new project approval life cycle uh, is in some way incorporating recommendations. For example, the very first recommendation was the elimination of the FSR process. So Chris, since we have you here, can you talk about uh, the relationship there between that task force report and your new process? Well, I, you know, I can talk about it probably. Andrea Wallen Roman's the policy person that's under her direction, but I'll give you the 365 degree level assessment of that. Is I think once they've developed the stage gate process for S1BA, they have four different stages of that. That stage one and two took into consideration lessons learned and best practices from previous projects. So to Jan's point, that information was considered and recommended and put into part of the project structure that Andrea and her team are moving forward with. So that information is, is part of that process now and, and is able to streamline that based on standards and requirements that have been accepted from the customer. 
Bill, real quickly, um, while we were hosting those task force meetings and we had Carlos several times as a participant, he brought forward the fact that the recommendations they were working on aligned with where he was already going. So the timing did seem to come together for both initiatives, but those things were already in work at Carlos's office while the task force was working on that as well. Thank you. Okay, um, question back here from Matt Williams. Uh, my question is, uh, all three of you said you're working on open data right now, and um, I think there's a perception among some that uh, maybe the civic tech community and the IT firms here in this room are somewhat separate and siloed to some degree. So I just wanted to pick, pick your brain. Do you think there's any um, opportunity for partnership or bridge building or actually working on projects together between the quote unquote tra traditional IT firms and the civic tech community at, at the state level or within your organizations? Well, I think there's great opportunity. Obviously, with the Governor's Green um, Challenge Codathon that we had a month ago, we plan to have future codathons, but also we plan to develop a governance structure uh, led by our government operations agency to bring in Department of Justice, Treasurer's Office, and other entities, as well as the private sector, into that discussion on how we can further drive innovation with using open source, but manage to some types of standards as well, and then help us reshape policy. So I think there's a great opportunity to partner and work with the state entities and also the private sector to bring those relationships together. Okay, last question. Anyone? Okay. This is a question for Jen. Um, you, you spoke about offboarding, right, in, in case that um, the relationship between the vendor and the state isn't working out for, for certain reasons. Have you, have you thought about um, some creative ways of then very quickly resuming? Well, the, the, um, the terminology off-ramp really came from the legislature. And um, it was Senator Roth who said, where are the off-ramps in these IT projects? In hearing after hearing, um, as people were presenting what their proposals were, he was asking if there were off-ramps. While we want to be sensitive to his request for off-ramps in the project, we are looking for a way to have a successful vendor relationship all the way through a project so we don't have to have those off-ramps. So under the proposal, the alternative that we're looking for where we have one contract and then we have independent work order authorizations, they're with the same contractor all the way through. And part of not writing that 1,000 requirements up front is we believe that when we complete one optimization initiative, there will be things that we've learned in there that we will want to build into the requirements of the next optimization initiative. And so that allows the vendor to be more successful because both the state and the vendor will have learned something in that optimi optimization initiative and we will apply it to the next one. And again, we expect that we will learn more things there which we can then apply to the next one. So we're not doing contract amendments and we're not, um, we're not finding ourselves at odd with with 1,000 plus requirements, we had objectives we wanted to achieve, and we're writing the, the detailed business requirements of each optimization initiative as we move forward. So while it gives the legislature the assurance, yes, there is completed work, we've received value for something, and so that does provide an off-ramp. We think it provides the opportunity for better continuation and a better state vendor partnership, because each piece of that optimization initiative is iterative and building so that by the end both the state and the vendor have a very successful partnership and a new model that the state could actually apply to other procurements. So it, it does address the off-ramps but we think it's, we think we're on a freeway, we're on an interstate and there may be off-ramps people want to take but we want to go from point A to point B and we want to stay on the interstate the whole way. Thank you. Okay, I think we are actually at the uh, time where we're going to take our break. I'd just like to, to thank our, our panelists for your candid answers today. Uh, Jan Ross, Adrian Farley, Chris Cruz, let's give them a hand.